Boop, 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 boop. Testing on okay. TV. Testing. Okay, okay, okay. Cool, 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 cool. Let me redo that because I realized it was. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Ava Hoffman and this is Outside the Lines, a line writer podcast where I interview line writer creators and talk to them about the artistry behind their tracks. Although he has been making things in line writer for much longer, UTD started posting tracks onto his current YouTube channel in 2020. Since then, he has been using his highly choreographic style to create unique and expressive line writer narratives. UTD's work takes frequently overlooked aspects of track making, like off-sled and video editing, and uses these elements to convey psychological and thematic information, such as the violent mindset of a serial killer in Cradles, or the experiences of an abuse victim in Silhouette. Heavily influenced by animation, UTD's work prioritizes line writer as a kind of video art over the conventional expectation that a track should be entirely in-engine or a single continuous piece. As a result, UTD's work frequently opens up new possibilities of expression in LineWriter, both technically and thematically. Today I'll be interviewing UTD about his latest track, Let the Bodies Hit the Floor. Bodies, set to the classic metal song, is a wild mosh bit of a track featuring some of the best off-sled movement LineWriter has to offer. Unafraid to veer into the absurdity of its premise and fully committing to its thematic ideas, UTD has created one of the most aggressive and aggressively joyous tracks of the year. If you haven't already, I'd really recommend you go see it. From its swarms of thrashing writers to its layer automated text, it's chock full of surprising and entertaining visuals. Great to have you, UTD. Hello. So first off, in your own words, describe bodies. Talk a little bit about it and what you find special or interesting about it. Um, well, Bodies is a fucking shit show. <laughs> it's, a, it's basically like a shit post that ended up being an unironic rush of adrenaline encapsulated into a line writer track. Yeah, so yeah, it started off as a shit post and spiraled out from there, right? That's how you started making it? Yeah, so what happened is one day I joined the voice chat in the LimeWriter Artist Collective and I was looking for my track files and I clicked on the track file named Bodies and I was just like, oh, I remember this and I just ended up showing it to the people in the voice chat and they were like, you've got to make this into a full track. <laughs> and I'm just like, I guess I could do that. What ended up happening was I ended up altering the original movement a bit because initially the falling boshes in the original would just kind of like stay stationary, but I wanted to like have the bodies flying everywhere, right? So I ended up changing the movement. The original movement I think is still available. I think I gave it to Bebabel before I changed it, so it should be archived. But from there, I was just like, okay, what kind of crazy movement can I do? from this point onward. What I ended up doing was I took a lot of the techniques that I did from my previous tracks and I just kind of implemented ideas around them because a large bulk of my work up until that point was largely experimental. Basically just like, ooh, what, what's some new ideas I can test out in LineWriter? What's something that hasn't been done in LineWriter before, right? Or something that's like original, I guess? Mm -hmm. And I think when I was making bodies, I was like, okay, I have all of these ideas and I've kind of like tried running with them in previous tracks. But now how do I take all of these ideas and like combine them together? Which is something I tried doing in my previous track, Silhouette, because with Silhouette, I basically wanted to expand upon the idea of like creating a story in Line Writer because that's what I tried to do with Cradles. Mm. Like, specifically with the subtext, because in Cradles, there was this whole racism subtext that kind of went over everyone's head and was way too subtle. Mm -mm. And with Silhouette, I kind of wanted to improve upon that in some way, and also take techniques that I've used in all of my tracks up to that point. But, you know, Silhouette was, like, very emotional, and it was also kind of experimental in its own right, because it had the whole post-production animation at the end. So it was also like kind of trying to be its own original thing in some ways, though still like taking influence from my previous work. I guess with this track, I kind of just like wanted to establish a kind of artistic voice when it comes to like the line writer tracks I make. 
So like elements that I've had in previous Slime Rider tracks before, like crossfading or multi-rider, repetitive movement that syncs jauntily to the beat. And I guess layer automation, because that was in silhouette. Uh, crayon lines kind of representing energy, because that was kind of in both With or Without You and in Headlock. And just like the general feel of Headlock being more of a weird video art thing than a real Lime Rider track. I kind of like wanted to implement all of this because I use it as a backlog to like make an extremely funny track, basically. It really does feel like this synthesis of a lot of things that you've done previously into sort of one very complete feeling work. It is really interesting. It started out as a shit post. I saw the original shit post version and it was like the joke was that opening with the ton of writers just like hitting the ground at the first floor, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you kind of took that joke and sort of expanded it outward using all these things you've been sort of practicing at, which is really interesting. Yeah. I think what makes the track special to me is that like it starts out as a joke and like your first time watching it, it's like really funny. But then like on like subsequent rewatches, it's actually like really energetic and it's like, holy shit, this is like unironically good, right? Like it's not like a line writer shit post where it's just like the joke is that, oh, do you recognize this meme? Well, here it is in line writer, right? Mm -hmm. I guess that's part of what makes the track funny. Like, oh, you recognize this song, right? From the late 2000s. That's kind of become a meme in modern day. Well, here it is in Line Rider, right? But it's also like, holy shit, this is actually kind of bonkers for a Line Rider track, too. You, you sort of take the joke seriously, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like unironic in a way, too. I'm not being like, haha, isn't this so silly in the middle of a track? Like, oh, ironic detachment. It's like, no, it's like actually kind of fun, right? Yeah. And I think that's what really makes the track special to me. At least to me. Other people might consider it like, ooh, the technical ability in this track is like, wow, incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I mean, like, I'm proud of the technical stuff that I did in some of this track, especially like towards the end when um, it panned into a static shot. Well, a quasi static shot with all the writers hitting the walls and the layer automated text like that took a lot of work. The camera is not suited for that. Yeah, and it required, like, multiple recordings and, you know, post-production shenaniganry. But, like, yeah, I'm proud of that. But it's, it's also like, holy shit, like, that's so fucking hype, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I think this leads really well into an interesting question about Offslet. So, like, Dismounted Bosch is sort of a state that has sort of been disregarded by track makers for a really long period of time, right? Yeah. Like Offsled is even sort of associated with like technical incompetence or a lose state, right? Mm -hmm. And as you've been highlighting, for you, Bosch dismounting and remounting is this theme that you've been exploring over and over, right? Like um, cradles along with bodies are sort of the two that are most obvious about that. Silhouette too. Yeah, silhouette and like headlock. You sort of have this dismounted moment, be part of a huge dramatic moments right with the like, scribble clouds and the falling off the cliff yeah and so as a result it's kind of fascinating right but with bodies you've created sort of one of the best and most technically proficient off sled tracks ever right so it's really interesting and i'm just kind of sort of interested in how and why you really started exploring off sled movement in line rider that actually is an interesting question because I've played Line Rider since I was a kid. I remember like I would always make Line Rider tracks and I would show them to my mom and she would be like, oh, wow, this is cool. And it would be like a fucking ripoff of Tech Dogs, a dog song. <laughs> One time I showed my mom this off sled track that I made when I was nine. It was like three minutes of Bosch just being off sled and just sledding very slowly on like some maze corridor thing. And my mom was just like, Wow, I hated that. That sucked. And I was just like, well, fuck. And then I, I got really angry about it. And she was just like, it's just criticism. Why don't you take criticism? I guess 
that moment plus a lot of the community pressure to like conform to a certain standard at the time with quirk and with scenery kind of made me feel like I had to follow a specific rigid set of standards in order to not only be accepted in this community, but also feel like I belong in there, right? Mm. For years, that kind of demotivated me from like ever like really getting into Line Rider. Because I was always into Line Rider. I think at most I stopped paying attention to it for like two years, but I didn't really like start seriously making Line Rider tracks until 2018. When I rediscovered Line Rider in 2016, I started familiarizing myself with all of these tracks that were coming out, all of these experimental-ish tracks, stuff like Rigor Mortis or stuff that Apple was posting in general, really, like here, stuff like Daisies, which was a flat sled at the time that was like extremely rare and it was actually like really good. Probably one of my favorite tracks of the 2010s. There was stuff like the, not the Gorge, uh, the Forest Under the Earth which like tried telling a story in Line Rider that was actually really emotional and is one of my favorite tracks of all time. But obviously the big one here is Ragdoll, right? Mm. Because Ragdoll was an off sled track that kind of like disregarded the notion that Bosch has to stay on their sled and also like shut down that whole moment I had with my mom when I was nine about like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do off sled anymore. It's like, I could probably do anything in Line Rider it's just the large reason why a lot of possibilities in Line Rider haven't been explored yet is because it's often been discouraged to do so in favor of, you know, meeting the standard. So in 2018, when I started familiarizing myself more with LRA, which offered a lot more possibilities than Beta 2, because people who started Line Rider after LRA released or like just forgot about Beta 2, kind of forget how bad beta 2 was and how <laughs> completely horrible it was in terms of workflow and like actually executing tricks line rider advanced made it possible for me to do things that i wasn't able to do before i remember the first track i made was just like this condensed quirk track that was like all red lines and i just did it because i could because i wasn't able to do something like that before but now with like plague back scrubbing i was able to do something like that and then I made something like Let Go, which was a track I made in 2018 that was this giant crayon canvas that Bosch would recycle through multiple times. And I would have never been able to do that in Beta 2 because if I were to recycle in Beta 2, I would have to place a flag and then edit the line. And then I would have to go back to the start of the track to see if it was edited in any way. And this is very unlike LRA where I can just do life lock adjust the line a little, and then see how the writer gets affected immediately, and I don't have to waste, like, probably several days just starting the track over and then trying to see if it recycles through. So I've always kind of approached LRA and then eventually .com, because .com would go on to have more features that would be interesting to experiment with. I always approached these softwares with, like, okay, what can I do that hasn't really been done or that I haven't been able to do personally in my childhood with Line Rider that I can do now with the advanced technology and tools. And so that kind of built up to 2020 when I made the track With or Without You. That was a standard slow burn track, but I had this great idea for an ending with slow motion, right? Mm -hmm. And that ended up revolutionizing playback speed in some ways. Yeah, that, that it, track is why the uh, timer mapping feature exists on .com now. Yeah, it, it led to that, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess that would lead into Cradles. Well, that and the track I released shortly after With or Without You on April Fool's called Run. Because that was like the first time I really was just like, okay, let's really make Off Sled a feature in a track. And at first I was just like, oh, this is a joke, right? Mm. I'm just going to release this as a joke for April Fool's because the concept of the track was like really esoteric and niche. It was just like, what if Bosch would like go off sled and just start recycling through parts of a the track they've sledded through in sync to the music for the entirety of the song? And I found that to be an interesting concept. But also like at the time, I was still like, mm, does this work? Is this like proper off sled? I don't know. So. It was better to like 
I guess, ironically detach and just consider it an April Fool's track, even though I personally find the track really good. And then both of those kind of led up to Cradles. Mm. Because after Run came out, the remounting feature got introduced, and that allowed for a lot more possibilities for me with off-sled movement that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. And so that combined with playback speed and also combined with other ideas I was tinkering with at the time, like combining post-production with the actual track, because post-production in Line Rider up until that point had felt like it was just like, oh, you want a flashy intro? Just edit that in post-production and be like, Alpha Leonis presents Resurgence, <laughs> da, 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 <laughs> Space Beam, and then the actual track plays. <laughs> um, right. And then that video editing is, it's like isolated. Yeah, it's completely isolated from the track. It's just like, what if post-production was part of the track, right? And that was kind of the big mentality I had when approaching Cradles. And so a lot of that ended up leading up to Cradles, along with other tracks I was looking at at the time, like Omniverse 2. And eventually that led to Headlock, which I was not satisfied with at first. I thought it was pretty low quality. But also it was like more experimenting with that off sled, right? Mm. That I've kind of been turned off from for a very long time. But I'm like, oh, I want to experiment more. I should experiment more with off sled. And that track ended up with the best parts of it being like the scribble section where the writer is like off sled and just bouncing off of scribble to scribble on beat, right? Yeah. And with the large Bosch coming in. Cross-faded Bosch face. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, I guess all of this like mounting expectations I had on myself and like what people expected out of me and what I wanted to do kind of culminated in Silhouette, Mm -hmm. which was like a very venti track where I just like express my fears that maybe one day Line Rider will be ruined for me the same way other things in other communities have kind of been ruined for me. And that track was like very much a healing process. And then once I started working on bodies, I was once again just like, oh, this is just a funny shitpost track, right? And then like people wanted me to make it more. And so when I started making it more, I was just like, this isn't just like a funny shitpost track. This is actually like, this can actually be like really fucking good. And then what happened was I ended up taking it more seriously than a lot of other projects that I would have otherwise deemed like, oh, this is stuff that would like really impress people, right? Mm. And a lot of things happened during the making of it. But basically when I released it, I was just like, holy crap, I'm completely satisfied with this. Well, actually the release date was interesting because I pulled an all-nighter on the track before realizing that I had to go to a musical on the same day. So I ended up finishing the track and publishing to YouTube. And then I went to the musical and I stayed up for 36 hours or something. Oh my god. I was just completely wrecked by the end of that day. It was horrible. (laughs) Yeah, oh my gosh. 36 hours. Yeah, it was horrible. But it was also like when I actually like woke up the next day and saw all the responses. I was just like, you know, this actually is pretty good. And this would be what I guess quirkers would consider like technically proficient. Mm. This would be like technically innovative in some way, but I didn't view it as that. I viewed it as like, oh, this is a funny track that I made. It's also like really energetic and like really aggressive, right? Mm. And I guess to kind of answer like what attracts me to off sled, it's just that you can have this technically proficient nature to Lime Rider, but also you can have like a whole other level of accessibility to it that you wouldn't otherwise get from like a regular quirk track, right? Mm. Because it's like when you watch bodies and you watch the movement in it, it doesn't feel like a Lime Rider track. It almost at times feels like a video animation that just so happens to use like Bosch as the character being animated. Yeah. And maybe this is a good way to lead into another question, right? Which is sort of related to that movement, the energetic yeah. movement that is very like accessible. I've noticed that a few people who like aren't really like into Line Rider as much, I've shown them bodies and they really liked it, right? Yeah. And I think an aspect of that 
and something that I find also really special in bodies is the way that you're capturing a very specific form of dance, right? And that's the mosh pit, right? Yeah. And obviously capturing the energy of the mosh pit works really, really good with Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, right? Let the Bodies Hit the Floor is a song about the camaraderie of the mosh pit, right? (laughs) Yeah. And the connection between line writer and dance has sort of been endlessly discussed elsewhere. But for Bodies and in your other tracks, it really feels like you're creating a specific kind of choreography for your writers. And you mentioned animation just earlier. Yeah. And often this choreography, it's not like dance choreography per se, it's almost theater choreography, storytelling choreography, right? Yeah. Like the sledder is attacking each other in cradles. And then the moshing in bodies is like more literally dance, but there's sort of a narrative of Bosch discovering the mosh pit in that track, right? Yeah. So how are you thinking about the relationship between movement and storytelling in your tracks? One thing that I think is really important is like the usage of invisible layers. Because this is the thing with like a lot of quirk tracks and what I mean by a different level of accessibility, right? Because a lot of quirk tracks have a very specific aesthetic, but appears very esoteric to most people because the main focus is the lines and how they connect to Bosch and how they pull Bosch. But if you're an average person, like watching a line writer video, you're going to see like a bunch of lines, and then Bosch is just wiggling around like, right? <laughs> so the way I choreograph my writers, it's like, I do it with the intention that I am going to make the lines invisible, and that Bosch is going to be the center and forefront. If you were to look at bodies with the invisible lines on, it would actually look like complete nonsense. <laughs> there would be like lines over everything, and more focus would be drawn on the lines than on Bosch. But because the lines are invisible, all the focus is drawn on Bosch's movement, and then you'll see like, oh, they're actually doing a specific dance, and they're actually making purposeful movement, right? So I guess a large part of how that relates to storytelling is it's a lot like animation, because like, I've had experience in animation, I've done animation before, and I've had like my own creations that I've made entire stories about, but when you actually want to like, make a story you gotta like make the story like what's the plot who are the characters you know Mm -hmm. a large part of animation is conveying all of that information across through the movement so i guess in some ways when i'm making a line writer track like this where the movement is like a central part carrying the story Mm. i often employ the same techniques that would be in animation like How do I express a certain thing like I would in animation? And what kind of movement would like move the plot along? Or like, I guess in this case, add to the narrative, right? But it's also a little different because I also have to consider like, okay, this is not a full-fledged cartoon, right? It's still a line writer track. So like, what would be a cool music visualization? And what would draw out the most emotion from the movement? Because, you know, Bosch doesn't really have any facial expressions obviously so you can't like have Bosch smile or have Bosch be scared or something like that and like show that for his face kind of like have to show that for the movement Mm -hmm. which is kind of something that is encouraged in animation when it comes to like learning movement right or learning how to convey across emotion in a character but applying that knowledge through the lens of like a different technical way of doing things, like how Line Writer is. So the way I consider movement and storytelling is movement is just another way of moving the story along. And there are other tricks I can use to like expand upon the story or the narrative, like post-production, or even just like a general concept that has been tossed around in the Line Writer community and has kind of gained a certain cultural connotation within the community that I can like then subvert or use to like signal, hey, this reminds you of this, right? Well, you know how that made you feel. The general emotions that are in that track are now being transferred here. Mm. I think there's a term for that. It's called, uh, hold on, reification. 
Mm. So it's like using reification to convey across specific emotions that would otherwise be hard to do if you were to go off of nothing culturally. Because this is also what I did in like Where a Silhouette Once Walked. I used the um, connotations that Where a Garden Once Grew had with me and with some of the Limerick community, and I subverted it to like tell a story. Mm. So stuff like that, it's just another part of a toolkit. It's very similar to like how movie directors have like codified their own filmmaking language when it comes to like stuff like lighting or specific motifs that are used constantly throughout film and pop culture. It's very similar to that. And it's like very interesting to like cultivate that in like a niche community like Lime Rider and a niche art form like Lime Rider. So like movement and stuff like that is just kind of another part of the toolkit when it comes to making stories. And that's the kind of association I have with movement and storytelling. Yeah. And and I think it's really interesting that your first principle, right, is that you want to tell a story. Your tracks are oftentimes about telling direct stories. As you're sort of highlighting, they have characters and plot beats. You're thinking about how does this movement characterize Bosch or how does it move the plot along, right? Yeah. And this is still pretty unusual for Line Writer. It's changing recently, but even in sort of narrative tracks, the narrative tends to be more abstract and oftentimes it shies away from like, distinct characters and characterizations and distinct plots, right? Yeah. Like, not many other people nowadays are making stories like where Bosch is a serial killer, right? And it sort of has put you at a forefront of a certain wave of narrative exploration and line writer. And I'm just interested, what is drawing you to line writer as a storytelling medium? A lot of things, really. For one thing, I talked earlier about how I kind of felt like I had to meet up to this rigid standard in the past with Lime Rider when it comes to like quirk or scenery and like what's expected out of a Lime Rider track. And um, this kind of feeling is not uncommon for me when it comes to like other things I'm interested in. I bring up animation. Um, Last time I made an animation was Silhouette. And that was the first time I made an animation, really, in like five years, I believe. And a large part of why I was turned off with animation is because a lot of animation is very hard to do, and it is very inaccessible, specifically to me as a neurodivergent person who has trouble telling stories in a way that other people would like connect to, or other neurotypical people, right? And the thing about animation is that it is a very cutthroat industry, especially the mainstream animation industry. And a lot of it is very heavily in favor of more neurotypical, well-off people who have a certain mindset when it comes to, like, grinding animation and, like, being on the grind set, (laughs) thinking that, the value of animation comes from how hard it is. And there is a lot of that elitism in animation, especially in online circles. Like, one of the most famous stories of animation, and you know about this, Mm. is with Richard Williams and The Thief and the Cobbler, which was a film that they spent like 25 years working on and had been picked up and funded by a studio. And the movie didn't make its deadline. The studio Miramax ended up releasing their own, like, bootleg version of the movie, and it bombed completely. But there's a recobbled cut online that shows a lot of the original animation that was intended for the movie, and the movie, for the most part, it sucks. (laughs) It's extremely slow-paced. The animation itself is more focused on the fact that it's all in ones and it's extremely smooth but without having like any of the weight Mm. when it comes to characters. And as a result, the slapstick feels extremely unsatisfying. And the story is just nothing for the most part and has a lot of problematic aspects to it. Yeah. (laughs) But here's the thing, like most people will look at that and go like, wow, this is a triumph. 
25 years, all that hard work, that's how you know it's good, right? And it's like, that's the mindset most people have with animation, right? Like, oh, this must have taken so much effort, that must mean it's valuable. And in some sense, for the longest time, that's the value people attributed to Line Rider, right? People would make these comments like, wow, this must have taken you so long. Mm. This must mean it's like extremely, that's how I attribute value to this track. It must have taken so long. It must have taken years to do. But obviously, how hard something is, is not what makes an art medium special, right? It's like the ability to tell stories and the ability to connect to other people. But this whole, I guess, rabid calls to gamification, which is a pretty good term to describe what happens to a lot of industries under capitalism in general, mm. is that people associate hard work with value instead of like personal connection or the emotion that they felt. And I guess what kind of draws me to Line Rider is that it's like a new art form. And so in a way, it's like kind of a way to break away from that. It's like, People don't look at bodies and think, wow, this must have taken so long to make. Like, it took two months to make. Mm -hmm. But that's not what people like about it. What people like about it is like, holy shit, this is fucking bonkers, right? This is unhinged. <laughs> the way the energy is captured in the song is the appeal of it. And that's the value people attribute to it. Mm. And that's what I want. I want people to look at art not from the perspective of how hard it was to do or how long it took to do, but like what it is and what it means to them. And I guess also what draws Line Rider as a storytelling medium to me is that it's like a chance to like kind of cultivate a kind of neurodivergent art medium. Hmm. Because the thing is, a lot of autism representation in general is either completely obscured, as in it's never really confirmed, or like straight up horrible. There's not really a lot of good autism representation. And not only that, there's not really a lot of avenues in terms of art where autistic people like myself can go to and feel like fulfilled in partaking in that art medium. Because oftentimes it can be a multitude of factors. There's like a disconnect between us and the community. And there's also like a disconnect between like the actual process of making the art and there's a disconnect of the cultural expectations that are associated with a certain art medium and what you want to personally see out of it. Mm -hmm. And there's not really a lot of avenues to go to to really express myself in a neurodivergent way. And Line Writer is like one of the rare art mediums where it's like there is no disconnect with me in the community. And also, it's like really fun and fulfilling for me to do personally. Mm. Not only because it was like something that I've been doing since childhood and it's something that's really been near to my heart for pretty much all of my life, but also just because of the way it combines, I guess, gaming aspects like keeping Bosch on a sled or synchronizing movement through drawing lines and getting a specific result, right? Mm. But also, like, all of those gameplay aspects add up to, like, something like a story or a work of art. And obviously, video games are art. There's plenty of, like, great art that has been made through video games. But, like, in this specific way, it's, like, the art in question is, like, a music visualizer or, like, something that can be enjoyed independent of, like, actually playing it, mm. but that you can still get into from a gaming aspect if you want to. And, like, I just find that really fucking cool. And I want to, like, expand upon that. I want to grow it, not in a way that it's, like, more people are aware about it or it gets more popular, but, like, more in a sense, like, I want to grow the cultural backbone of this community and, like, offer more possibilities for the art medium. And it's, like, if I can do that, if I can, like, cultivate, if I can help cultivate, at least, an art medium that does appeal to neurodivergent people and i guess hopefully in the future like more marginalized groups of people like that would be really cool i think that would make the world a better place for a lot of people who otherwise would not feel represented by a lot of things that are in more mainstream when it comes to animation or just media in general 
And to be fair, like that is improving in like some aspects when it comes to like neurodivergent representation. Mm -hmm. I know with the Owl House, like Luz is a neurodivergent character who has ADHD, right? Right. So representation is kind of improving in a lot of aspects, though there is still, of course, rotten apples. But like there's representation and then there's something you can like go to. There's something you can like feel like you belong in that has a community cultivated specifically for you. Mm. And I feel like a lot of neurotypical people have that and a lot of neurodivergent people don't. Mm. And so I think by making Line Rider this neurodivergent or like making Line Rider in part, at least, a neurodivergent art medium for people to explore, it would help me specifically, but it would also help others feel like they are valued and that they matter Mm -hmm. and that they are heard at least by someone. Mm -hmm. So that's what draws me to Lime Rider as a way to tell stories. Right. Yeah. And in that you're, you're talking a little bit about like pushing the narrative possibilities of Lime Rider forward. Yeah. And you've been doing that in like a variety of ways, right? Yeah. We've talked a little bit about like the movement and the way you approach storytelling. But another thing that's sort of really interesting and consistent throughout all of the work on your YouTube channel and for bodies, this is even true. The video for bodies is like, it's only a little bit edited. There's like a flashback scene, some editing involving line color and a few very subtle cuts, right? Yeah. And yet... The choice to edit the actual track visuals at all is still very rare in Line Writer. For a long time, tracks were generally thought of as single, continuous, unedited works, right? So yeah. the idea that you could download the track and like watch it play out in Line Writer if you wanted to, at least conceptually. Only recently have Line Writer creators been really exploring the use of video editing. And you've been at the forefront of that push. Yeah. There are the subtler edits and bodies, but also some very extreme editing choices. Like we've talked about a lot of them already, right? The slow motion and with or without you, as well as the cut into a long animated sequence in silhouette. Yeah. And you've previously called these kinds of video edited line writer works. You've called them non-tracks. Yes. Yes. And you've repeatedly emphasized the artistic value of these non-tracks for their ability to expand line writers' expressive capabilities. How did you start adding video editing to your work? And how do you personally go about combining line writer with video art? Well, before line writer, I was part of a community that I don't really want to get into or ever associate with again. But... I bring it up because in that community, I kind of learned how to video edit with Movie Maker at first, and then eventually into Sony Vegas, I learned like video editing tricks and basically like how to make a standard YouTube video, right? And when I left that community and started getting more into Lime Writer, I started thinking like, I have all these video editing tools at my disposal, but I don't really have any video essay I really want to do. Or I don't really want to make a standard YouTube video. At the time, I didn't even really want to make any more YouTube videos, honestly. I just kind of wanted to focus on my job. And that changed when uh, COVID hit. And I couldn't focus on my job. So at first, I just sprinkled in a little bit of video editing. And that was with or without you. And also run. Because the video editing in run was just I would speed up or slow down the footage whenever it would sync. But... Cradles was really the turning point because it was just like, okay, I have all these tools at my disposal. And also, Line Writer does have this whole history when it comes to like post production. You've kind of like touched upon this in your Animoya 2 track mm. with introductions and stuff like that. So, what if I took all these techniques that I've learned when it comes to video editing and combined it with Line Writer, right? Because I wanted to feel like that was useful for something. But also because once I did do that, it did expand the expressive possibilities with Line Rider. So the way I go about conceptualizing a Line Rider track is basically just 
if I listen to a song and I want to make a line writer track to it, I'll just start thinking of strong narrative ideas that like the song brings out of me or like that I associate with certain lyrics of the song. These will generally be like isolated ideas Mm -hmm. at specific parts of a song. And then when I actually start making the track, because this is how it worked for bodies, I'm just like, okay, now what do I do for this part? How do I connect it? How do I make this complete? Mm. And I guess a large part of post-production is just knowing that that possibility is there, that it is something I can just resort to, and it's something convenient, and it's something I have experience in, and it's something that's fun to do if I want to like convey across a specific narrative element. So it's really just taking stuff that I do have skill in and just applying it in a way where I can express myself fully. And that's kind of the way I approach it. I definitely am not the first to do this, like Dangerous Cargo. And also there have been tracks from even back in the day, like Shadow Ninja's Mario level. And even Tech Dog experimented with it in some Unbound releases. Mm. There has been experimentation with it in the past, but it's like, it hasn't really been generally accepted as like a major part of the line writer community, right? Mm. Because more people were either like, okay, the major parts are scenery, or you're a quirker, or you're a noob, (laughs) (laughs) right? Right. So I guess this is kind of something I alluded to in my Cradles making a video, Mm. but I guess the main reason why I really push video editing and non-tracks in general is because I want people to know that there's more than just quirk and scenery when it comes to ways to approaching line writer. Like you don't just have to be a quirker or a scener. You can like make it a multimedia project like in Silhouette where it's a line writer track that leads into an animation, right? Mm -hmm. It's like different art mediums combined into one. And you can also like employee video editing and you can combine it with the track it doesn't have to be like a binary of quirk and scenery and that's it there are probably an infinite amount of ways to approaching line writer and post-production non-tracks implementing video editing is just one of them and one that i find to be personally very fun and fulfilling yeah for a lot of the things we've been talking about 2020 was a really important year in this shift, and you're emphasizing all of these elements of your track making style. I have watched some of your older 2018 tracks that are preserved on the Line Writer archive, and these older tracks are definitely different. They're more conventional, right? Yeah. Than With or Without You and After. And it makes a lot of sense why With or Without You is sort of the first video on your current YouTube channel. Yeah. And it seems to be, in some sense, a departure from your previous work. What do you think prompted this sort of change in your style? So what prompted this change is like, it was fun at first, right? Like exploring Lime Rider Advanced and like all the possibilities I can never do as a child. All the quirk, all these weird ideas that I would want to like implement in Lime Rider. It's like, wow, I can finally do all this now. But after a while, it's like, Okay, now what? Mm -hmm. After a while, like, making conventional tracks just got kind of boring. I mean, With or Without You is still, like, a mostly conventional track outside of the ending. But it's like, that took several months to make. And a large part of it was just like, okay, I'm gonna draw these squiggly lines throughout the entire thing. And I'm just gonna have to keep drawing more and more of them as the writer speeds up with the song. And it's just like... I want to do something more with the medium, right? Line Rider, after a while, became like, what kind of funny challenges can I conceptualize and try to beat in some ways? Like, just a random challenge. Like, can I have a track that Bosch rides that I could then get him to recycle on beat to the music off sled? And that was basically run. Right. But at the same time, I kind of wanted it to be more than that, especially because after Omniverse 2 released, that was the moment where I was like, I know Line Rider can be more. The potential is there. Omniverse 2 showed that entire potential, right? And it's right there. It's just like, how do I realize it? And that culminated in Cradles. Like, 
it really was the turning point because that track took two weeks to make. And when it released, it kind of blew up. And also around this time, like it wasn't just me, the wider line writer community as a whole was like becoming extremely experimental and a lot of innovation was going on around the same time that Cradles was going on. Like two days later, the Devourer of Gods release that kind of like killed Quirk <laughs> <laughs> because most Quirkers regard it as like the best Quirk track and it uses entirely invisibility mods. And basically the whole gamification mindset that a lot of Quirk was rooted in back then. Like, oh, you have to have Bosch be on Sled and you can't use any hacks. It's just like, no, who cares anymore? And also around the same time, a good chunk of the Geometry Dash community was getting into Line Rider. Mm. And this would lead to tracks like You Are the Sunset by Jade and Freaks, which would go on to start your Line Rider career. Yeah. <laughs> as you've talked about. <laughs> and... Even earlier on in that year, there were tracks like I Can't Ride These Lines Without You that was like the main turning point when it came to storytelling and line writer in general. Even though at the time I didn't get it, I feel bad saying that, but like at the time I did not understand what story was trying to be said with I Can't Ride These Lines Without You. I didn't really see it. And then Beba Bell's video essay kind of came out. It's like, wow, that really is very nuanced. <laughs> and like for like two years, I was just like, I don't get it, <laughs> which is why I, I didn't even mention it in my making of Cradles video when it came to like talking about tracks that had a story within them, because it's like, is there a story here? Am I not getting something? <laughs> <laughs> that track is still great for the record. No shade of that track. I really love that track. It's willfully subtle, right? Yeah. It's supposed to kind of be hard to get. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that Beba Bell really went into in their video essay. But it's like that track was also really important because it got people to think what the emotional power of Lime Rider could be. Mm. So all of this that was going on at the time, combined with my own exploration of what I want out of Lime Rider and my own style, led up to me eventually just changing my style over time and changing what I prioritized in Lime Rider the most. And I guess since Cradles and since 2020, I've just been like, diving deep into it mm. it's not like this is something cool i could try let's try it and then let's do another challenge like a lot of my tracks from 2018 up to even 2020 with some of the earlier tracks on my channel and it's really cool because it feels like i'm building something yeah i'm building like this certain part of the community i'm building this narrative voice for myself mm -hmm. i'm building this atmosphere throughout all of my tracks because like when you watch through all of my tracks, it kind of flows into one mood after the other. And all of my tracks so far have been like very consistent in terms of what techniques I use and how that makes me stand apart or how that makes my storytelling stand apart. And that feeling is just really cool. It's much more fulfilling to me than just making a standard conventional track. It can sometimes border a little bit into like, oh, I want to one up myself. There is that expectation is like, oh, I'm going to make the next Cradles because that was what happened with Silhouette at first. It's like, oh, this is going to be the next Cradles. It's going to be even better. It's going to be my magnum opus. It's just like I'm going to one up myself, right? So there is always that kind of expectation that eventually leads into burnout and that I have to divert away from mm. or else I will like completely burn myself out which is what I did with Silhouette. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of making non-tracks for me isn't just as an avenue to one-up myself, but as a way to get more fulfillment out of Line Rider. And I think there's a really important distinction to make between not being prolific because you want to make something that you are personally proud of and not being prolific because you're burning yourself out because you want to one-up your previous project. Yeah. Burnout in Line Rider is, is an issue, for sure. We, we mentioned, I can't write these lines without you, and Beva Bell talks about that in that video essay. And speaking of other tracks, you've mentioned other tracks and Line Rider creators that have been influencing your work. I'm interested to sort of hear uh, about how your influences have affected the tracks that you've made, especially with bodies. Well, the influences for bodies are... I mean, 
the way I look at a lot of my influences, it's like, it really depends on like what I'm taking influence from. Because sometimes a track will have a certain idea that I don't think capitalizes on it in the way that I would want it to. Like, not that it did a bad job at like executing the idea, but it's just like, oh, this idea would be really cool for this other concept. And I would want to really take advantage of that to express this other idea, right? I do that a lot. Yeah. In most situations, it's like that. Sometimes I do the exact opposite to convey across a point. This is what I did with Silhouette. One of the anti-inspirations for Silhouette was You Are the Sunset. And You Are the Sunset is most well known for like having movement to convey across a story, like having this rough, unkiltered movement to convey across these very powerful emotions. And for the beginning part of Silhouette, I wanted this extremely smooth movement that like didn't really convey across any emotional power. And the attempts at doing so, like with crammy wools, would just kind of fall flat, right? Mm. And so I kind of like modeled the beginning of Silhouette's movement as like the opposite of what You Are the Sunset did with its movement to like convey across a sense of nothingness or like a sense of emptiness. And then there's influences where I literally just take the entire track and recontextualize it, like what I did for Where a Garden Once Grew. Mm. And Where a Garden Once Grew specifically. It's a track that helped me through an existential crisis I was going through in 2021 because the idea that all things fade and eventually your life and even the knowledge of your existence will fade away from collective consciousness is something that would actually keep me up. Like, I would not be able to sleep some nights because I was constantly worrying about that. And by the time I released Silhouette, I was just like, okay, I got this track out there. And then where Garden One Screw came back into my mind, it's like, this thing is going to fade away eventually. And when that thought came across my mind, it was the first time I was like, that's not a bad thing. Mm. I want this trauma to eventually fade away or like become less severe over time. That was kind of like a breakthrough for me in terms of dealing with my existential crisis because the idea that all things fade wasn't a bad idea inherently. It was a neutral idea. And I wanted to express that in some way. I made Where a Silhouette Once Walked and I felt released. I felt like a burden was lifted off my shoulders because for pretty much all of my life there was this idea that, oh, I have to be famous. I have to be successful, right? Because that's what capitalism and the American dream kind of brings up on you. You have to be successful monetarily and socially and not just successful. You have to be famous. Mm. You have to have your name known everywhere. That's the pressure that society at large pushes onto you. And it's just like the realization that no... I don't have to be this. In fact, it's preferable that my story is not constantly in the spotlight and that I can move on from extremely traumatic events and that I can carve out a life for myself that I want to live for the sake of living in, not for the sake of like any legacy or any fan base that I want to attract, right? Mm. I can just live my life for the sake of living it and associate with the people I want to associate with and have the experiences I want to experience. Like, that idea was unfortunately completely foreign to me for most of my life. And once I realized it, life didn't seem so scary anymore. I mean, obviously, there's still a lot of scary aspects about (laughs) the world today. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But like, you know, on an existential level, it's not as scary. Mm. It's kind of beautiful in a sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I do. (laughs) So the influences I take from a lot of tracks I make are just kind of an extension of what I'm feeling for the most part. And sometimes what I feel from a track will be moderate, and sometimes what I feel from a track will 
impact my life in an extremely positive way that I would have never anticipated, especially as a kid, to come from a line writer track. Like a line writer track positively impacting my life? How? And it's just like, it's because line writer is an art medium and line writer has cultivated this community. And the fact that it can affect me in this way, the fact that it has that potential, if I can realize that potential even further, and if the rest of the community can realize that potential further, that would be amazing. Yeah. With bodies, now that it's out in the world, how are you feeling about it? How do you make sense of it as this thing that you've made? The thing about things I make, this is something I decided for myself two years ago when I was starting to really shift my line writer style, when I was starting to really get primarily into line writer. Like for the past several years before that point, like before 2020, a lot of the videos I made were videos that I would go on to regret, videos that I would go on to repress, videos that I would not want any more association with, videos that I would not even want to watch anymore. And I hated it. I hated that the stuff I was doing was not something I would want to come back to because it was too painful to do so. And so come 2020, I was just like, I'm done. I'm not pumping out videos just for the sake of someone else or for the validation of a community, right? I want to make videos that I will want to watch years down the line. Videos that aren't going to be like painful to remember. Mm. And when I decided that for myself, Lime Rider became much more appealing to me because Lime Rider is a creative art medium and it does have that evergreen quality to it. It's something that you can watch years down the line. Well, tracks eventually get dated over time because of better techniques and better tools and better tracks that come along that take previous tracks and do them better. But even stuff in like really, really early, like like One-Eyed Giant is still really good. Yeah, that doesn't mean it's completely obsolete, right? Mm -hmm. You can still watch Line Rider tracks from 2008, scenery tracks that still are like great videos to watch. Because even if the techniques or even if the way that Lime Rider is nowadays is completely different from how it was back then, it still stands up on its own, right? Mm. And that quality is what I really strive for when it comes to making my videos. So when it comes to how I make sense of bodies after its release, it's the same thing I kind of do with all of my tracks. And as it's just something I can watch. It's something that will be there years down the line. And it's something that I can be proud of Mm -hmm. still to this day. The same way I'm still proud of Cradles. The same way I'm still proud of all my tracks, really. Even the tracks that people overlook, like Fix You, right? Mm -hmm. Because Fix You was kind of my first attempt at really like emotional storytelling in Line Rider. And I experimented with a lot of different ideas. And that track is often overlooked because a lot of the ideas weren't really executed that well, Mm -hmm. I guess, to some people. Like, people would find it too minimalist, or people would think that certain aspects of it were a bit cheesy, right? Mm. But I'm, here's the thing, I'm still proud of that track. It may not be, like, my best track or something, but it's like, I made it, and, like, I tried it, and... It led to works in the future that I am especially proud of, like Silhouette. And it's like, that's not something I would want to shove under the rug. I make these tracks for myself. Like, I didn't even look at the responses to Silhouette for the first two months, mostly because of anxiety, because that was a very personal track, and I didn't want to, like, read something that was just like, wow, this is shit, I don't get it. Mm. What the fuck are you, what the fuck is this bullshit, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you put animation in a line writer track? <laughs> I didn't want to read something like that. I was scared of reading something like that. Mm. And eventually I got the confidence to read it. But it's like, I made that track for myself first and foremost. Because it felt like something I had to make for myself. And I'm still incredibly proud of it. And likewise, I'm still incredibly proud of Bodies. I'm still like really proud of all the work that put into it. I'm especially proud of the story behind it. Because there's also like the story behind it to consider for me too as a creator, right? Because Silhouette was kind of like a way of 
transferring all the feelings and fears and anxiety that I had at the time onto like the creative process of making that track. Like the idea that, oh, it's not perfect enough. The idea that nobody will get it. Nobody will like it. And eventually I'm going to regret everything, right? Like just transferring all those feelings into like that vent of a track. And, you know, that whole story when it comes to like the creative process is interesting to me. And likewise with bodies, what happened in the middle of bodies. And I think I do want to talk about this publicly now is that I found out that I was plural and that I had like multiple personalities, which is something that I was not aware of until midway through making bodies, like my headmate just started talking to me. Well, my headmate didn't just start talking to me. I started recognizing that my headmate was talking to me and that it was a headmate talking to me and not just my conscience or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And through making bodies, I would go on to develop a kind of understanding of my headmates, and I would go on to develop a greater understanding of myself. And due to this, I was able to finish bodies actually, like, extremely quicker than I would have otherwise had I been on my own, had I not had anyone to support me or be there for me when it came to working on the track. Not in like a friend support way, but in like a, I guess, material way. Like reminding me to do something with the track to continue working on it for myself, because that's what I wanted to do. The headmates are Infinity and Beyond, who I give special thanks to at the end of the track, because without them, I still don't think the track would even be released now. And right now I'm in a bit of a tough situation. I don't want to get into that because it's more personal, but I am personally in a bit of a more tough situation. And the past two weeks have basically just been me trying to confront that, knowing that I'm now plural and that there are other people who rely on me as I rely on them. And trying to be, I guess, a functional system of people. Right? Yeah, totally. And it's difficult, right? But I'm glad I made bodies because not only is it like, as you said in the intro, aggressively joyous, like it's a very joyous track about mosh pitting, about bosh pitting. <laughs> <laughs> and being one with the mosh pit but it's also just a liberating experience for me personally to discover myself and move forward when it comes to how I see myself and how I want others to see me it was a way for me to move forward in terms of what I can do and how I can function in life mm -hmm like a healthy way to function in life there's a pathway to it and bodies was like a joyous kind of vision of that mm. like what could be so yeah there's a lot i make out of bodies the same way there's a lot i make out of all of my other tracks really and you know different tracks to me mean different things to me because they're all different experiences at the end of the day mm. And I think that's what makes art so gratifying to me personally, is the experiences that I have with making art and the stories I associate with the art that I make and what it means to me personally. That it might not mean to anyone else. It might only mean this way to me specifically. Like, nobody is going to look at bodies and probably think of it like, oh, this was a self-discovery thing when it came to plurality. I mean, maybe <laughs> now, now that I've <laughs> talked about it, but like nobody's going to like look at it isolated and think, oh yeah, this is about UTD self-discovery with plurality. Mm -hmm. That'll be only my interpretation, but it's something special to me. And it's nice to have that. 
Absolutely. What do you hope for from the future, either in line writer or in life or in both? Well, I mean, really, the main thing when it comes to line writer, I just hope it continues going down the direction it's going down right now. Because the line writer community, especially in the past couple of months, has become like extremely experimental and more focused on like the storytelling capacities of line writer and the emotional capacity of line writer. Like I've been really digging a lot of Instant Flare's newest stuff. Mm. Especially with their exploration into like dreamscapes and nightmares, like with Fever Dream and I Wish I Could. Mm. I've been really digging that. And you know, tracks like Mount Eerie. Yeah. <laughs> just completely experimental yet emotional and I guess exciting way of looking at things in this burgeoning new art medium. It's like, yes, I want more of that. <laughs> I want to see more of that. That shit's cool. Obviously, like, people can do whatever they want in Line Rider. Like, if they want to do, like, quirk or if they want to do scenery, I'm not going to, like, be like, oh, you can't do that, right? <laughs> you can't do that. It's outdated. You gotta get with the times. Like, I always will encourage people to do whatever they want with Line Rider. Mm. Unless it's, like, actively harmful, obviously. Right. But, you know, I want more accessibility with Line Rider. And I guess, in many senses, I want the exact same thing for a lot of other niche online communities of sorts that are not as mature as Lime Rider and are still stuck in the whole gamification mindset that a lot of the early Lime Rider community was kind of stuck in and that kind of kneecapped a lot of the potential growth and a lot of the potential accessibility that Lime Rider could have had back then. Because mm. there's a lot of niche online communities that fall into the trap of like, oh, there's this objective standard and we're going to impose it on everyone. And if you don't do this, you're not valued in this community. Like perhaps the most prominent example is Geometry Dash. I've never played Geometry Dash, but I've definitely been aware of communities like it with its whole rating system and how levels are judged extremely harshly, how people get harassment just for making a level they don't like because they view art as an objective kind of thing instead of something that is more subjective. And as a result, they harshly impose what they consider common sense standards onto others who don't view Geometry Dash the way that they do. And that's extremely common in a lot of niche online communities that are specifically like gamer centric, that are populated by a lot of bored teenagers, as Rabbit described in their gamification video. And so I just kind of hope that that gamification mindset, the whole objectifying art in a way, that mindset just one day goes extinct. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously that mindset will never go away, but it, like stop being as prominent, right? Mm -hmm. Where the norm is more like what Lime Rider is doing right now, where the norm is communities that are more welcoming and accepting of novel ideas and don't judge something based on how hard it was to work on something or the technical ability of the creator, right? Mm -hmm. Like they judge it more on how it makes them feel personally and how they can add more accessibility to other people who might not otherwise be welcomed in the community. And when it comes to my life, I just kind of hope to get out of the current situation I'm in right now, honestly. <laughs> yeah. But, like, long term, when it comes to what I want to do with my life, right? Like, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> what do you want to do? And it's like, at this point in time, I am 21. And I have no fucking idea what I want to do with my life, honestly. It's like, I have plenty of avenues to go down. There are plenty of possibilities. But when it comes to, like oh, what's the main thing you want to do? It's like, I don't have an answer, and I honestly don't think there is a main thing I want to do other than just live life. Sometimes I want to do one thing, sometimes I want to do another thing. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Inherently, it's just that under capitalism, right? It's just like, 
oh, you have to have this one thing that you do all your life and then you retire. Mm -hmm. And that's how it works. But that just sounds incredibly debilitating to think about like just one thing. That's it. I mean, I have lots of interests. There are lots of things I want to do. So I guess the plan for my life as a whole is that I have no plan, <laughs> right? Right. The main thing I want out of my life is to feel like I've lived a life that I can be proud of. And with Lime Rider, it just feels like one more step to achieving that. And I guess the main thing is that I hope one day I can feel free to talk about all of my interests and all of my hyperfixations with like a regular person. And I don't have to feel like weird about doing so because of how hyperfixations have been viewed by other people throughout most of my life. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this is weird. Nobody will get it or nobody will even know about it. And it's like that kind of feeling has permeated throughout most of my life. Like, people won't take my hyperfixation seriously. They're like, who gives a shit? This is just silly, right? Mm. And I just want to get to a point one day where I don't have to feel like that's the case whenever I talk about something like Lime Rider or any of the other interests that I have, right? Mm hmm. And I also want to make it so that I also don't have to worry about whether or not I want to introduce people to the community around a lot of the interests that I have. Because sometimes I'll worry about whether or not people will get my hyperfixation. And sometimes I'll worry about, oh shit, the community around this kind of thing sucks. And I hate it. And I don't want anyone to join the community. <laughs> I guess that's the main thing that I would want out of Lime Rider, out of my life is just to be free to express myself without it being traumatic, right? Yeah. I want to feel free to express myself in a way where I can feel like I am worth something. Yeah. And I guess that's basically it. Like, what else do you want out of life, really? I mean, aside from the world not being a piece of shit, but... <laughs> 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 yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs>